technology, every single grade, and that's the story of the evolution of Wade. It's time for AB 3-5 in Mr. Wade's curriculum. So now here we have relative extrema for the first question today. All right. So if you passed integrated three, you should know that extrema, the extremes, are the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys, what we call relative maxima and relative minima. All right. Find all the peaks and valleys. Now, if I ever see in a math problem, maximum, minimum, increase, decrease, those four words mean take the first derivative and also draw the first derivative number line as we have before. All right. So if you see extrema, since that means maxima and minima, still take the derivative, do a number line. All right. So we've got a piecewise function today. Now, a wise man once said, plug in the phase change first. The phase change is zero. E to the zero is one. And natural log of one minus zero is the natural log of one. The natural log of one, we're supposed to know that. It's zero. Zero plus one is one. So input zero, output one. Ah, it's a match. It's not always a match, but it's matched so far. So these two curves are connected. They might be a crooked fit. They might be a smooth fit, but they are connected. They're not a jump. All right. Now, let's get down to business. Take the derivative. F prime of x. All right. Get your wrist warmed up for the curly bracket and curly bracket. Derivative of e to the x. Remember exponential functions? Remember the last chapter? The derivative is keep it the same. Write everything down the same times natural log of the original base e times the mandatory chain rule. The chain rule of x, the derivative of 1x is 1. But the natural log of e is 1. And all those things drop and you just get e to the x. Remember a prior discussion where e to the x is the one type of function that will stay the same every time you take the derivative? It's very unique in that way. So e to the x comma x greater than zero is the domain. And the derivative of natural log of one minus x. One over base, one over one minus x, times the chain rule of one minus x, which is negative one. Be careful, don't forget that it's negative one. And the derivative of the plus one becomes plus zero. So let's see if we can rewrite this. Isn't that just one times negative one on top is just negative one over one minus x? Comma x less than or equal to zero. Okay, so there's your official derivative right there. And now we're going to do the first derivative test. What's that thing I always talked about? You do case one first. Is there any place where the derivative equals zero? Now, first time we've done this with a piecewise function. You do have to check both, both functions, okay? The top one's e to the x. Is there any place that e to the x equals zero? All right, two ways you can do this. One is just graphically. Isn't e to the x just exponential growth? Looks like that. Doesn't exponential growth have a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis back in integrated three? You remember this? e to the x is always above the x-axis. Its value is always positive. It can never get to zero. That is impossible. Now, if you don't believe me, and if you want to do it algebraically instead of graphically, you can also do it algebraically. We learned in integrated three, the one way to get rid of an e is to take the natural log of it if you remember, all of you in this class were very good at that back in integrated three. Take the natural log of both sides. That would help you cancel E and it would get X by itself. But the natural log of anything that's not positive is impossible. Natural log of zero doesn't even exist, nor do natural log of negative numbers. You can only do the natural log of a positive number. So see, it's a dead end either way. Okay, e to the x will never equal zero. Now remember that in the future. These exponential growth functions will never equal zero unless somebody put like subtract two and shifted it down two. But just basic exponential growth and decay, never zero. Now let's check the other one. Can this one ever equal zero? Negative one over one minus x. When do fractions in math equal zero? 
only when the top equals zero. The bottom can't even be zero, right? Does the top equal zero? Negative one does not equal zero. So for the first time ever, or maybe the second time this has happened, we got nothing from case one at all. Okay, total dead end. But you gotta check because sometimes you get something from case one in a piecewise function. Case two, is there any place that this function is non-existent? F prime D and E. Let's find out. Okay, uh, does e to the x ever not exist? No, e to the x is just a nice continuous function. It always exists. No holes, no jumps, no vertical asymptotes. Okay, that's how you know that it's always existent. So we're not going to check that one. This one, there's one place this one doesn't exist. Where is this thing non-existent? Does not exist at what? Can't divide by zero, right? How about x equals positive one? That would be bad. Positive one would give you one minus one. But is this going to be a factor today? Remember the piecewise functions, they have parameters, they have domains. X equals one is not less than or equal to zero. And so I intentionally did this to kind of avoid that bad place. So it turns out this one is invalid, even though it normally would have been valid because it does not fit the domain. Okay, so on some minor technicalities here, we basically got nothing from case one, case two. Now there's something I haven't told you yet. There is a case three. Three things in calculus, all right? So when you make your number line test, find any place the derivative equals zero. Find any place the derivative is non-existent, i.e. discontinuous. Case three, only when it's a piecewise function. Pick the phase change automatically. No matter what it does, just pick the phase change because you have to plot that on the number line because you could miss the problem if you don't do that, okay? So even if x equals zero did not pop up over here or over here, sometimes it will already. If it doesn't, put it in there automatically, phase change. Now let's draw our number line. Here, let's go to the other board. And we'll draw a number line, label it F prime. And we're gonna mark nothing from case one, nothing from case two, but case three was zero, all right? So we need to plug in test points. So to the right of zero, we could plug in like 100. To the left, we could plug in negative 100. Don't make any marks for your sample points. Those are secret, all right? Only make a mark for what came from case one, two, and three over there. So now let's plug 100 into what is this? The first derivative test. You must plug your sample points into the first derivative. 100 into the derivative. Wait, which one? 100 is greater than zero. Aren't we right now to the right of zero? So greater than zero, oh, you plug it into the top derivative. E to the 100th, my gosh, that's positive. That's a gigantic number. You can't even measure that many millimeters, e to the 100th. There aren't that many millimeters that you could stretch around the known universe. Now, take negative 100, that's less than zero, plug it into this equation. Negative one over one minus negative 100. Negative one over one minus negative 100, okay? That's negative one over, that's plus, so it's 101. It's a negative fraction, it's a negative outcome. Okay, if the derivative is minus than plus, doesn't that mean the original function f, this graph up here, must be decreasing to zero comma something, and then increasing, right? Isn't that what the first derivative test tells us? Decrease, increase. That's a valley. It might be a crooked valley, it might be a smooth valley, but it is definitely a valley. Okay? Matter of fact, I happen to know that it is a crooked valley, but that doesn't matter. It's still a relative minimum. So it said find the relative extrema. So what you would do is you would tell me which one it is. Relative minimum. And it does say find the coordinates. So don't just leave it zero comma blank. Go ahead and tell me the y coordinate. Plug zero back into, where do we get y coordinates? Original function. Oh wait, we already did plug it in in advance. It's a match, the answer is one. By the way, if these mismatch, you would say no solution because you can't be a jump and be a peak, right? Or a valley. 
If they match, put that here. If they mismatch, put none. There's your answer. Clever problem. Now for question B, we've got the minimum value of y equals e to the x minus 2x. Okay, when the graphs get more complex, we're not quite sure what they look like. It's kind of exponential growth, but it's also kind of linear at the same time, so we're not positive how to graph this from integrated 3. Don't worry about the graph. Trust the calculus. Keyword, minimum. Maximum, minimum, increase, decrease, those four words mean take the derivative, but also do a number line. So we take the derivative of this function, y prime equals, now remember exponentials, right? When the x is in the exponent, it's called an exponential. And you remember the derivative is three-step process, keep it the same, times natural log of the base, times chain rule of x is one, Natural log of e and 1 don't end up mattering. Remember the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Remember that one? And minus 2x is going to be minus 2. There's our derivative. Okay, now remember what we do. Case 1, case 2, and if it's a piecewise function, case 3. Case 1, set your derivative equal to 0, and that was our derivative. But wait. Can e to the x minus 2 equal 0? Remember earlier, exponential growth can never be 0. But exponential growth shifted down 2 can be 0. Add 2 to both sides. You get e to the x equals 2. Now, take the natural log of both sides, just like back in integrated 3. Natural log of both sides. You get cancellation. x equals natural log of 2. That's the result of case number one. That is called a critical number right there. There is no case two, because there's no place that an exponential would be non-existent. And there is no case three, because it's only for piecewise functions. So we draw a number line. We draw y prime. We mark natural log of two as our mark right there, okay? That's the landmine. Don't step on the landmine. You can pick any sample point in the world except for the landmine. So when you pick sample points, now normally what do we do? Something above natural log two, we go like 100, right? Normally, let me teach you a new strategy today. I don't know what the natural log of two is. Nobody's supposed to know what decimal that is. It doesn't make any sense to even know that decimal. Pick a number that is bigger than natural log two. Well, if you don't know what natural log of two is as a decimal, how would you pick a number bigger? How about natural log of three? That's definitely bigger than natural log of two, okay? So the new strategy is if these aren't whole numbers, pick something that kind of resembles the critical number, okay? Something smaller than natural log two, you could pick natural log of one, although we know natural log of one is zero. So zero would actually would be a good choice because it's definitely lower than natural log two, okay? So that will help you when you get these, you know, not normal, not nice whole numbers or integers right here. Pick something that looks kind of like it. Now, what do we do? Remember the first derivative test? Don't we just take these little nuggets right here and we plug them right back into the derivative? So the derivative is e to the x minus two. This would be e to the zero minus two. On this side, wouldn't it be e to the natural log of three minus two, okay? That's one minus two is a negative, is all we care about, just the sign. This cancels, no wonder I told you to choose natural log of something. The e and natural log cancel, you get three minus two, which is positive. Okay, now what does this tell us about the original graph that we weren't quite sure about? It's not quite exponential growth, by the way. You know what that graph's gonna look like? We just discovered that it's minus plus, so decrease, increase. There's a valley on this graph right there, okay? And we're actually looking for the minimum value, so since we're looking for that, you can tell that the graph goes down up. Natural log 2 has got to be exactly where this whole curve just bottoms out and comes back. So the minimum value is going to be right at x equals natural log of 2, right? And by doing your cases, you found that out. Now, there's one little thing. You don't want to just put x equals natural log of 2 on a test, okay? x equals natural log of 2 is the location, the x-coordinate, of the minimum value. 
Doesn't it say find the minimum value? Wouldn't you think they'd be asking like, how low can the graph go, right? So think about this. If I ask, how tall is Mount Everest? And you say Tibet. Wait a minute, Tibet? That's where it is. Yes, Mount Everest, the peak of Mount Everest is in Tibet. But when I say, how tall is Mount Everest? You wanna tell me 29,000, 29 feet. You wanna tell me the actual elevation of the tallest point on Earth. So if you tell me the minimum value is located in the country of natural log two, well, how about telling me how low that is? How do you know how low something is? Is it, a, is it an X coordinate? No. Isn't it a Y coordinate? The Y coordinate is how low something is, right? So I wanna let you in on a little secret. When you see the word value in the future, value in calculus or in any level of math means Y coordinate, actually. Inherently, it means tell me the height or the depth, give me the Y coordinate of that, okay? So value means Y coordinate, unless you occasionally see X hyphen value, give me the X value, okay, that's X. But value means Y. So don't forget to plug natural log of two back in. Where? Derivative, original function, where do we get Y coordinates? Original function. So natural log of two is where it is, but y equals e to the natural log two minus two natural log two is how low it is, okay? See, I just put natural log two in for x. That cancels, e to the natural log cancels, and you get two minus two natural log two. That's the minimum value of the graph. That's only where it is, you get partial credit. That's full credit, that's how low the graph goes, okay? By the way, I'm curious as a cat. It's probably why my friends call me Whiskers. But you know what? Two minus two natural log two, I put it in a calculator, it's about 0 0.614, okay? So the low point of that graph was about 0.6. Never does go below the x-axis, I guess, because its lowest y-coordinate is still positive. Interesting, huh? Anyway, let's go over here to the other board. Okay. Find the minimum value of the derivative of f of x equals given. All right, so how do we find the minimum value of the derivative? It's another classic trick they put on the AP test, and I want my students to be able to catch it, okay? So, I see the word minimum. The word minimum means prime, right? Take a derivative, do the number line test, all right? Maximum, minimum, increase, decrease, and a number of other words we've used this year, like rate, like slope, all these things that mean derivative, right? Now, it's kind of a trick question. The minimum of the derivative, isn't the word derivative also a prime? Minimum of the derivative is the prime of the prime. It's a double derivative secretly. And a lot of students will do the first derivative and then they get it wrong. So derivative of the derivative. All right, let's do this. Let's find f prime of x, and that would be two comes down, double 27 is 54. One of those things that's not on the times tables that comes up a lot in calculus. No, two times 27 is 54. x to the first plus three times three is nine, x to the second, drop it by one. If you set that equal to zero, You'll get solutions, but they won't be the right solutions. They will be the solution to some other question. That is the derivative. I'm gonna put der right here. But we want the minimum of the derivative. And the word minimum says take one more derivative of whatever you're talking about. So the minimum of the derivative is one more derivative. F double prime of x, as we said earlier, 54x goes to 54 plus two times nine is 18 x to the first, set that equal to zero, case one, and do a number line test. We're gonna call it an F double prime test because that's where we are right now. So it's an F double prime test, but it is testing the minimum of the derivative. So solve that. Could we subtract 54 over? Don't subtract 18 x, keep your x positive at all times. Subtract 54. So 18x equals negative 54, divide both sides by 18, 
and x equals. We do non-calculator tests for the most part in this class because I want you to get your mental math skills sharp for the AP test and for college. 54 over 18 is not on the times tables, but 18 times 3 is exactly 54. I want you to know that because it comes up, another one that comes up often. There are only a few of these that come up over and over and over again for whatever reason, and this is one of them. So know that 18 times 3 is 54. All right, negative 3, that is my critical number, so to speak, even though we're on the double derivative, and the critical numbers are supposed to be the first derivative. But this is a critical number of f prime, technically. Now pick your sample points. All right, I'm larger than negative 3. How about 0? That's an easy one. I'm smaller than negative 3. How about negative 100? I kind of feel like I can make this into a kid's video, right? I'm smaller than negative 3. And then we can do this whole, this whole routine, you know, for kids, right? So kids can understand calculus, right? I'm negative 100. Okay, so anyway, I digress. Take this, plug it into what you've labeled your number line. Plug it into the place where you set it equal to 0. So we're going to put this into the double derivative. If you plug that there, you get 54, and then 18 times negative 100 is like minus 1800. Okay, that's a smaller minus a bigger, and a smaller minus a bigger is always negative. Okay, I feel like you could probably teach that to kids. I probably could make a, a kid show that would teach like little children like a lot of stuff about calculus. How about that? I bet it would work too. Take zero, put it in for x. 54 plus zero is positive. That's all we needed. Okay. Now, doesn't the double derivative tell you something about the first derivative? The double derivative is only one derivative past the first derivative. It tells you the increase decrease of the previous function, which was f prime. It tells you that f prime is decrease, increase, minus, plus. Okay, so it's, ma it's not mapping out. Now, wait a minute. The double derivative does not map out the increase decrease of the original function. No, 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 it's not mapping out that function over there. It's telling you the increase decrease of the derivative right before it. So what it's telling you is that f prime is going down up. What was f prime? f prime was a second degree polynomial. Didn't we learn in integrated three that second degree polynomials are parabolas? It's an x squared. The first derivative was just a u-shape. Now the original function was a snake, but the derivative was a u-shape. So the next derivative after it told you down up. Yeah, no joke. It's a parabola, of course it's down up. So that's what you're actually discovering here, okay? Find the minimum value of the derivative. Here's one more place you could make a mistake. Didn't we say today that value is a y-coordinate, which means go to the original function? This is when it's not go to the original function. Value of the derivative. We're finding a value of the derivative. It's kind of like a y-coordinate of the derivative if you were to graph the derivative, which is a parabola, okay? Value still means y-coordinate, but it's the y-coordinate of the derivative. So when you read value of the derivative, make sure you take x equals negative three, which was clearly our lowest place, right? That's your minimum, x equals negative three. Don't plug it back into the original function. Plug it into the derivative to get the value of the derivative. What's the derivative worth at negative three? What's the bottom of this parabola, in other words, okay? So negative three goes back into f prime. f prime of negative three is 54 times negative three plus nine times negative three squared. Okay, now 54 times negative three is kind of crazy without a calculator. They put things like this on the AP test and in college, by the way. How am I supposed to do this efficiently when you've given me such gigantic numbers? Here's how you do it. G, C, F, 54, nine. Group A, group B. Isn't there a nine in 54? Know your times tables, right? If I were you, I mean, you could multiply this out the long way, but if I were you, I would take a nine out of both of these groups, okay? Then I would notice that this group has a negative three, this one has a negative three squared. You can take out a single negative three from both groups. 
factor out the GCF. Now write the leftovers. I took a 9 out of 54. 9 times 6 is 54. I also took a 9 out of this 9, and that's 1, or gone. I took a negative 3 out of group A, gone. I took a negative 3 out of group B. There were two, but there's one left. Okay? And you end up with 6 in the first group and simply a minus 3 in the second group. Do you see how small these numbers are now? Do you see what happened there, right? Small numbers. This is so much easier, okay? You're all too young to remember the James Bond movie Skyfall, but at the very end, and the villain says, do you see what comes of all this running around? You see what comes of all this running around, Mr. Bond? This is where the class usually goes, Mr. Wayne, we know what James Bond and Skyfall is. Okay, it's better with a live audience. Nine, negative three, six minus three is three. This is a great skill to have to be able to take out a greatest common factor as a number, not with X's for a change. You can take out numbers, okay? I highly recommend it. If you wanna be a top level calculus student, you wanna take out a GCF of numbers. Now you get nine times negative three times three is negative nine. Nine times negative nine is negative 81. You can do that in your head. Final answer, negative 81. By the way, the valley of the parabola was apparently input negative three, output negative 81. But don't write the whole coordinate. That's the real life interpretation. But don't write the coordinate. Just give me the minimum value. The value of the derivative is negative 81. Okay? Lots of good stuff in there. Lots of good stuff that you need to be learning from me because nobody else is going to teach it like this to you. So this is going to give you a huge advantage for college. Okay? And that was it. It's a pretty short lesson. So that covers it. Now I guess it's sample test time. So start to do some problems on your sample test. And I'll see you in 3-6 to fix anything that you have not seen in this chapter. Hold it now. That's definitely bigger than natural log of 2. Okay? So new uh, the maximum, minimum. I take a oh, I this really stinks. Ah, it's a disaster. By the way, I'm curious as a cat. Hold on, my friends call me whistle. Here's how you do it. Gre Greasy F? It's the Greasy F. GCF!